Right, well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar, and uh, the latest in the sequence of webinars that Perend has been uh, providing for the last 18 months or so. My name is Alan Presland. I'm the chairman of Parenta and author of the book, Improving the Business of Childcare. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping rules, please, before we get on with uh, today's event. If you would all uh, be kind enough to keep yourselves on mute, uh, sometimes when we have uh, background noise, it's really distracting for our presenters. So if you could just keep yourselves on mute throughout the presentation, I'd be really, really grateful. Um, we uh, will go through the presentation shortly and uh, please feel free to ask any questions whatsoever, but please do so in the chat facility at the bottom of your screens. If you go and add any questions you like or any comments you would like in the chat facility, then at the end of the presentation, I will ask our speaker those questions and we'll work through everything. But without further ado, it is my absolute privilege today to introduce you all to Juno Sullivan, MBE, the CEO of London Early Years Foundation, who is our speaker. A uh, little bit about June. I'm sure many of you will have heard of her beforehand, but a little bit about her. Um, June's award-winning London Early Years Foundation currently runs 42 nursery, nurseries across 12 London boroughs. She is an inspiring speaker, author, and regular mediator, comma, media commentator on early years, social business, and child <laughs> poverty. And she's been instrument, instrumental in achieving a major strategic, pedagogical, and cultural shift for the foundation, which has resulted in increased profile, new childcare model, and stronger social impact over the past 10 years. So none of you want to hear me today. You all uh, want to hear June. So it's my absolute pleasure to hand uh, control of the presentation over to June. June, floor's all yours. Lots of people here to listen to you. Good morning. Um, and it's very nice to see some familiar faces or at least familiar names and some nursery backgrounds as people are doing their work and listening at the same time. That is very true of the early years sector. We never do one thing, we do 10 things at the same time. Um, I'm sorry I'm a bit hoarse today. I'm just recovering from a really nasty virus that wasn't COVID. <laughs> Um, and um, I might, I, I hope not to cough, uh, but um, I'm going to just go through these, these slides just to get us going on stuff. And I'm hoping that you will ask some questions that we can sort of dig into. I originally was going to do my own, um, my own slides, but Gail's going to do them for me. <laughs> I can't, this whole notion that we can multitask is not true. Honestly, we can do lots of things separately well, but when we try and do everything together, something goes awry. So uh, I'm not one of your multitaskers. I'm relying entirely on Gail to multitask for me. Okay, I'm, I'm just, I, I'm sure some of you have heard me talk about this before, but you know, what do we mean by child poverty? And I've, I did a TED talk in 2018 and, um, and I describe child poverty as a scourge on our nation. And, and I think it is because I think people don't realize the implication it has for everybody else. Uh, it's not a problem that's over there. It's a problem that's all around us. And I think for many of us in the early years sector, we see it really right, large and in front of us. And certainly since COVID, we've seen it even more so, I think. I don't know what Gail is doing, but it's all rather interesting for the rest of us. But uh, perhaps, perhaps we could go to the second slide. And I, I'm a real fan of Muhammad Yunus. Um, I don't know if any of you have heard of him, but if you haven't, it's definitely worth right reading his books. He's a, a Bangladeshi um, social entrepreneur. He started off Grameen Bank. He took the view that the poor is really about the systems that are created and the institutions have designed the concepts we have formulated. And it's not actually about the sort of feckless poor, the, you know, the, um, the images you get on the, on the press, um, you know, the, uh, the sl sloppy woman in her pajamas, the guy who's sitting at home all day long, shouting and screaming and not doing anything. That's, I'm sure there are some of them around, but for the majority, the poor isn't, isn't like that. So what, what Muhammad Yunus noticed was that 
if he could give small grants or small loans to people that were affordable and they could pay them back, they would actually become very independent. And so he set up sort of what they call micro loans and he shared them and um, he started in Bangladesh and it's now across the world. Monique, the second thing he noticed was that if you gave them to women quite often, they were more likely to pay them back and more likely to use the money that they made from their little businesses they set up to educate their children. So actually the response of a tiny microloan had a kind of ripple effect on increasing uh, people's ability to <clears throat> self-sustain and their children benefited because they were more educated. So it's an interesting idea. And I think we have to look into our hearts as to what we mean by poverty, because quite often the press is casual about it and the stereotypes are unhelpful. <clears throat> Oh, Gail, next, yeah. So what does that mean for us in early childhood education and care? Um, you'll notice I've been using that language more and more, actually, uh, ECIC. It's, a, it's more of an academic descriptor of, of early years, but I find it quite helpful because um, early years doesn't really tell us anything. The early years just suggests something about a period of time, but actually, our role in the early years is very much about education and care. And it's kind of sad that we have to still spell out care as a matter of, of you know, of, of importance, because I would assume that education includes care and care includes education. And the two are so interlinked. You can't do one without the other. Every time you change a child's nappy, you're caring, but you're also educating because when you do it well, you're singing a song or you're talking to them or you're just engaging with the child. It's, you know, a, a, a good setting doesn't have a kind of conveyor belt of nappy changing processes. So, but I think for the, because the, the sector sometimes needs to be much more explicit, uh, I, I like to use the term early childhood education and care. And also we're part of a, an international community. I don't think we always think that. I often think in our sector, we feel very alone and very isolated, but actually we're not. We're part of a huge, early childhood um, international sector. And so therefore, we ought, to, we ought to consider using language that is um, going to open those arms to other places and open our, our, our conversations more widely because we have a part to play in eliminating poverty. Now we're faced with a problem because the policy that is being developed to support parents coming to out of poverty is around going to work. But you and I both know that going to work isn't the problem, isn't going to solve the problem on its own. Because we don't actually think it's particularly working, because the system that they've created around it, which is well known to all of us, called funding, is neither sensible nor fair. And actually, um, the statistic that really disturbs me, and I'll try not to be cranky about all of this at the moment, um, I'll try and be positive all the way through this. But you know, do you guys know that only 5% of the DFE's budget is spent on the early years, yet we know that they have locked um, their policy around reducing poverty. And so we're help meant to help with that, but on a budget of only 5% of their entire 100% budget. So that, that begs the first question, I think. Uh, Gail. So at the moment, um, child poverty costs us 25 billion quid a year because of all the uh, benefits that are necessary, the failures in, in health, the, um, the housing costs and, you know, the major problems that poverty kind of a, sort of supports because actually there's nine children in poverty in the classroom of 30. That's a lot of children living in poverty. And what do I mean by poverty? The Social Commission um, defines poverty as really earning less than 60% of the median. And that that actually is, um, means that they're taking into consideration core costs, that's your housing costs, your food costs, and your childcare costs. Before they used to just include the childcare costs, but as you and I on low, you can't work unless you've got childcare. And so the circle requires you to have childcare. And actually nowadays, I've often used the term, but childcare is part of our infrastructure. So you can't do without childcare. If you create an economy that's, where two parents are, two people have to work to enable them to put a roof over their heads. And so therefore the consequence is this, that 
So we have this level of poverty, over 5 million people living in poverty, and 70% of those are in work. I mean, that's like crazy. And it's gone up. Um, I've said 60% here. It's actually gone up now because uh, since COVID. And these people living in what you might call the kind of so-called gig economy, when we think about the gig economy, it sounds quite sort of sexy, you know, oh, you know, uh, trendy, techie people, you know, that sort of thing. Actually, for the most part, it's Uber workers, hourly, hourly rate workers, you know, people with no security, no ability to save, no ability to know if they've got enough money coming in uh, in the following week. So that level of poverty and that um, and that level of people working in that level of poverty is kind of it's pretty shocking, actually. And so. Um, so the idea that, you know, everyone's poor as sitting at home on benefits is just not true. Gail. <clears throat> now, Nelson Mandela and many great people like him have commented about our society needing to take care of its children. Uh, Desmond Tutu, uh, you know, referred to Ubuntu and brought that concept, uh, that African concept into uh, our, the, the sort of Western world. Um, and took us back to our traditional history of where, you know, the entire community had a responsibility for rearing the children, even when I was grown up. And, and, and that's uh, not that long ago. If a neighbor caught us misbehaving, we were in deep, deep trouble. You were more scared of them telling your mother than anything else that you, you have ever done. Now people don't engage in that. I mean, you know, in the olden days, you get a clip around the ear from your auntie. And I used to have hundreds of aunties, but none of them were connected to me by, by blood. They were all my mother's friends or somebody else. But before you even got home, you knew you were in trouble. And to some degree, you know, as a child, you were kind of resistant to that, but it did make you behave better. Or if you did, you try to hide. But now there's no uh, there's no um, kind of sense of that. And everybody is uh, all about their rights and, and nobody's kind of looking out for people. And that's OK. You might think that's quite you know modern. But for a lot of children who need someone to look out for them, who need someone to stand up for them, who need someone to advocate for them, they're lost in this. And and um, and it's not and it's not spotted. And we see that with the continuing number of children and the continuing number of reports you get from social services when a child's been mistreated and uh, no one has uh, listened or you know noticed uh, so I think this comments that these great leaders make about society taking care of its children is is one that we all need to own and I think for us in the early years or you know in our early childhood education and care sector we, we, we are actually great advocates for our children and I think genuinely love our children. Um, but we have a bigger job to do, which is to really kind of raise some of the structural issues that they're living in. And poverty is one of them. So why should we address poverty? Because actually it affects everybody. Um, we want all, all, all of our children to grow up safely. I mean, whether you live in a trendy, gentrified part of London or you live in a small rural community or you live in a busy town, wherever you live, you want your children or your grandchildren, although I'm sure I'm never going to get grandchildren because of climate change, apparently, according to my children. But anyway, somebody else's grandchildren I'll, I'll have to adopt. Um, but you want them to be able to go to the shop and buy whatever they want to buy and come come back vegan sweets probably uh, so you want them to be able to go to the shop buy their vegan sweets and come back fe feeling safe you don't want to be worrying about them being you know attacked or uh, got caught up in a gang thing or you know in that part of the ridiculously high level of youth violence that you see now you want them to be able to go out and have chat with everybody get on with what they've got to do and come home safely and that is quite important and poverty actually stops that process because it creates crime, it creates disconnect, it creates anger, it creates uh, lack of safety, it creates neighborhoods that become disillusioned and disadvantaged, and all of that impacts on everybody. So it's everyone's interest that we should address child poverty. And it also breaks our hearts to see children coming to nursery without shoes. Um, we saw a lot of that after COVID, uh, without the right clothes for the winter. You know, we talk about the importance of children being outdoors and, and, and a leaf nursery. Um, you, you have to be outdoors for two hours a day. Not at the whole time, but at least two hours a day. You need to be out, you know. So, you know, children can be with us up to 10 hours. No, we're not asking a lot here. 
But what we find, what we often say is there's nothing wrong with the weather. It's about the clothing. Well, the clothing, the fancy pants clothing that you need to be outside is quite expensive. For a lot of parents, that's just not a no-no. And then we worry about that. So we find ourselves, and I know many of you as well, raising money for basics, raising money for food, running food banks. My n- number of my staff have, of their own volition, have created the most wonderful services in the community because they saw what they saw. We have worked with charities like Sal Shoes because the children were coming in in shoes that didn't fit them. And, you know, um, welly boots, which are hard to run around in and climb and, and really get into, get into real serious physical development and without the right clothes for the winter. And we're, that is very evident of a sign of poverty. That really also is a sign of the trust that parents can have with settings, childminders, our schools, where they feel able to say this, or they feel able to accept help, because the other sort of myth about the poor is they're always looking for something for nothing. That's not true either. They're actually, you know, people are, can be very proud and can hide and can look at ways of pretending everything is all right. And only when they're desperate do you get a clue. And if you have a trusting relationship and really good early years people have with their parents, that they'll actually let their guard down and then we'll help. Because can you imagine what happens to a child who's poor, who's not got the right shoes? What happens is you can't run around, you can't walk and you can't exercise. Therefore, your healthy lifestyle is affected. Therefore, you're more at risk of other things like obesity, poor poor, um, coordination, spatial awareness. All of the stuff that we know about how children develop is affected by some small thing that nobody else would notice. We all don't often say this, so people would not realize why they have why having shoes isn't an important thing. It's not about even the shoes. It's about the physical freedom and the ability for those children to develop by having the right support and the right things that they need. And I don't think always people understand that. And I think we need to say that much more clearly. We, make, we need to make the link between the implications on child poverty and on children's ability to develop. It's not always about cognitive. There's a lot of focus on that, and that's important, of course. But actually not to be able to run around because your shoes are slipping up and down or not being able to climb up and down because you know, you're, they're slippery. All of those things are an indicator of poverty that only we often notice. They're those small, tiny, noticeable things that we get that actually we can do something about in our settings, but as a voice, we could do something more about, I think. Gail. Um, basis of every family ch- child is from to have a nurturing, caring, stable environment that promotes their health, nutrition, protects them, and kind of has affectionate interactions. And you can be poor and have that all of that. So sometimes the other thing about poverty is people often think that um, poor parents are bad parents. And that's not true at all. Poor parents are often very stressed parents, they're very anxious parents very on the edge parents. That doesn't mean they don't love their children. So I hate that negative association that by being poor, you're bad. That's not true. And in the, in, when I grew up, we, weren't, we, were very, we, weren't, we were really quite poor, but so was everyone else. So at the sense, you felt you're part of a community. So poverty, kind of 1970s poverty was, you didn't have all the things that we have now. But we did have very affectionate parents. We didn't have much money. We didn't go fancy places. We didn't have fancy clothes. We didn't have anything really. We didn't have any technology. We were outside playing on the street. And, but we were, there was a sense of safety. And for a lot of children, that's not what they have. But for a lot of children, that is what they have. But their parents are still under pressure. And where we can intervene is really helpful around that. And access to affordable childcare is a really good step into that. And I take you back to the DFE, 5% spent on the early years. Gail. Now, you all know this, I'm sure, um, and I'm not going to fixate on it, but these are just things for you to pay attention to when you read these slides with your staff. Language, language, language. That's the thing, guys. The whole of the LEAF pedagogy is based on the notion of cultural capital. And what do I mean by cultural capital? I mean, giving children opportunities, Now, the best way to give children opportunities is to help them to speak. When I say help them to speak, it's about giving them rich, 
beautiful descriptive language that opens their minds. Because when a child speaks and has a wonderful array of language, they also start to think more. You have to be able to, to, to speak, to think. You have to be able to think, to speak. It's a kind of a circle. And so therefore, what you can do without worrying about any of the big structural issues of poverty is you can extend and enrich your children's language. Don't underestimate the power of a book. Spend your money on, on that. Do and enjoy conversations with your children and extend them and extend them and extend them and reinforce it. And then with your parents, you can build in the pedagogical conversation where there's more talking and thinking and thinking and talking. And two wonderful words that frame a decent pedagogical conversation are because and so. If there's any leaf staff on this session today, they'll know what I'm talking about, because and so. Because when you describe something to a parent and you use the language that you have with that parent, whether they're a professor or they're uh, you know, an Uber driver, uh, you understand you know, the way to talk to them. Or they could be a professor who is an Uber driver. You, you know, but you have your relationship with the parent, so you know the kind of language that's familiar with them. But when you introduce because and so, you describe what you're saying and you're making sense of it for them so they can see the consequence. Do you mind finding all the red doors on your way home today? Because Tallulah is fascinated by red and you are reinforcing it because red is part of the way we support children's mathematical learning. And so it'll help her to move through that learning you know, and become possibly a mathematician as she gets older. You're just using because and so all the time. And that frames that conversation. That pedagogical conversation should also be used constantly with your staff. Every time you talk to them in a like casual way, as you walk around the nursery or you're sitting together or you're um, in the garden, because and so. Because that's what we need to get better at, understanding the reasons why we're saying what we're saying so people can understand the implication of it. Have a chat with your child this evening about fish because she's really interested in it and it's part of the way we teach science. So therefore, in the end, you're supporting her science learning and you know she could be a marine biologist. That's the kind of thing that we're talking about here. So when you think about big structural issues on poverty and you hear the fantastic Neil Leach talk about funding and unfairness, and I get very sad about the 5% and we know we're way behind on the funding, we know all of that. There are things that can overwhelm you, but there are things you can do. So, so far, you can find them shoes that works. You can support a uh, food bank if you need to, though it, it grieves me to even be saying that in 2021, we're talking about food banks as a service to our population. But, you know, that's another thing. But you can do a lot to support a child's language because that's a great predictor of their success. Also, it's probably time you revisited Carol Dweck's work and, and rethought mindsets. Um, here's the social factors um, from Steve Mumby from the National College of School Leadership. It's, it's an old quote, uh, but it's a great quote because he, 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 he lines these things up. The social factors that influence educational success are the quality of life, the level of poverty, the level of social capital and the social class of the family. These are all structural issues, but we can impact. We can impact on number two, like I said, and on number three. What is social capital? If, you're, if, you, if you have some free time and a long bath, take into the bath with you the work of Robert Putnam and don't get the book wet. His book is called uh, Bowling Alone and he wrote it in 2000. And what he's defined is, what is social capital? Social capital is the networks you create, the connections you make, the community that I talked about. Even if your neighbors are getting calling you out and getting you in trouble, they are a network that you could find as a safety. Nowadays, these aren't always around, but a nursery, a childminder, uh, a, set, a preschool setting can create its own social capital. You indeed are a catalyst. You have no idea, guys. You never know just how important you are. You never, never know it. I've been working in this sector nearly 30 years and I've visited, I can't tell you, nurseries all over the world. And they always say, I'm just a, I'm just a nursery nurse. I'm just a nursery manager. Oh, we're just a nursery. What a nonsense. You're actually a catalyst for huge community engagement. You have no idea how important you are. 
you know, for some people, you are the only saving place for them, the only safe place for them, the only place that makes them feel good about being a parent, the only place that someone else loves their child like they do, the only place where they can be completely safe. Do never underestimate the social capital that you bring to the, uh, to the world and the local community. Never, ever underestimate that. And even though we're mistreated by the government and our status is low, actually our status is much higher with the people who, who know us. Our voice is quiet on that. Our voice should be noisier on that. Our voice is noisy on the wrong things, I often feel. That the focus only on funding means it doesn't look like the fact the majority of us are actually small, engaged and probably socially enterprising businesses the way that LEAF is because we want to have a social purpose at our heart and our social purpose surely is we provide affordable accessible and high quality services to all children and that includes children from disadvantage <clears throat> sorry Gail yeah Again, I quote my old pal, um, Muhammad Yunus, who I actually didn't meet. Um, he says, indifference is the enemy. Okay, so just with that in your mind, let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> so I, I've mentioned this a lot, so we don't need to worry about this, but this is really, you keep thinking about these things. How can you work with somebody like us? How can we help you? How can you frame what you do against those three things? Where is it that you're doing those three things? Um, and quality, of course, is, the most important in the end, because we can give children a standard care and education, but unless it's high quality, children with disadvantage will be doubly disadvantaged. They have no way of, of undoing bad teaching. They have no way of undoing lack of care. They have no way of undoing sloppy, ill-considered, poor services, the tr where, where staff are neither loved, trained, or, or promoted, or um, supported where the setting is sloppy, dirty, untidy, messy, where the environment is not seen as a third teacher and you're not paying attention to it. And you know, you do not have to be a rich setting. We're not a rich organization, Leaf. Everything we've done, we've grown from nothing. But I have an absolute obsession that the nursery environment has to be beautiful. Whether it's in a porta cabin, a fancy house, a... Um, you know, the back of a building, we, I can tell you, we're in the most odd places. We're in basements, we're on roofs, uh, you know, but when you walk in that door, you are in a world of just great, calm, <clears throat> connected, warm, engaging, resourced learning space. That's what you walk into. And you can make that from anything. So throw out your crap tidy your place don't paint the walls with stupid colors that you think are nice think about the way things look to a child they don't need a load of color and leftover paints from people they need calm 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 they don't like uh, confusion many children from disadvantaged families come from a lot of confusion a lot of chaos they need to come into a calm quiet space and it might look too naked for you but think about it Think about it. They also don't need to be in a nursery that looks like some kind of showroom where they can't play with anything because everything is laid out like it's some kind of, um, you know, display on, on wicker. They need a balanced amount of stuff. They need stuff they can engage with and play. And listen, by having a few rooted vegetables and, you know, nutty vegetables, unusual vegetables, you know, gnarly stuff, you know, calabrese, you know, plantain, big fat sweet potatoes in your role pay area is not going to solve the world's population of poverty. So therefore you can have them, but you can actually add value to the local market because you've bought something for them. And if you're worried, put them in the fridge and they last a week. And frankly, that couple of quid is much more beneficial to those children than you getting all uppity about, you know, the world's poverty issue. It's not going to make any difference, but it's going to give those children a really great learning resource. OK, <clears throat> Gail, I'm sure we're running out of time. So that's LEAF. Keep going. That's our pe pedagogy. If you're interested, I have a whole team of wonderful people who will tell you all about that and uh, and explain it. But listen, there's just one thing in here I'm going to pick on. You see this multi-generational approach, that's social capital. 
that's the bit where you're the catalyst. That's the bit where you get involved in your local community and you do something useful. Okay. <clears throat> I think you should, I, I mean, I would like, you know, before I die, and, and in the last few days, I thought it was coming close, to be honest. Um, I want as many of the um, early years sector to think about being social businesses as possible. Because you're, you, you know, we, it's a credible source. And we aren't trying to manipulate or make personal gain out of any of this. We want to do something that's going to benefit the sector in a much wider way. It's going to benefit children. And it's just the way you frame what you do and how you think about your purpose. It's, uh, it's not about using your profit for two Jaguars. Uh, it's really about um, thinking about how you, how you use the money, how much you reinvest in, the, in, in, in your team and in, in, uh, in the children and how many children you can support and fund. And that's a challenge because the funding, as we know, is in, in, uh, insignificant really. To be honest, we're about two pounds 60 per hour per child short. But the more children you can take like, that you can give the free offer to fully without the additional hours is really, um, a, you know, a mark. And it, the more you say you can do that, the better. However, you have to do it in a way that makes your business work. You are not able. Don't do it if you can't make it work because you put yourself at risk. And the more you try and help out um, the government, the more they take us for granted. So there's a very fine line to operate along on that. But I think as a voice together, where we have a social purpose that we articulate, then I think we have a chance of actually getting the voters behind us and parents behind us to understand that the value we bring, not just in the immediacy, but in the bigger picture for all children. And remember, 5.2 million children live in poverty. Okay. Uh, Basically, that's just what it means to be uh, a nursery manager or a nursery leader. You are a magician every single day of the week. You know, this is your five minutes of peace with the Gruffalo. I mean, the fact that your five minutes of peace is with the Gruffalo says something about the kind of challenges that, you know, that we have to deal with. Because frankly, I think many of us are a bit like the Gruffalo, really, trying to figure the whole thing out. And, and also people say, oh, you know, you, you, um, you work with children. Oh, nice. Oh, not lovely. And you think, well, actually, no. Working with children is, of course, all of those things. But when you work with children, you, you throw yourself into the middle of a political chaos because suddenly you find you're having to learn about a business, how to run a business, how to negotiate funding, how to negotiate contracts. How to understand about big structural issues like child poverty, how to understand about the implication of things like child obesity. What does it look like uh, in terms of staff development? What about the structures around apprentices? How do you support and develop staff? What do you find yourself doing as multi-layered? Yet we are treated like we are, you know, nice but dim. And that, I'm afraid, is a stereotype we have to really kick out because the fact is. And this is why at LEAF, there's no such thing as practitioners. They're all teachers. And because they are teachers, you know, when you, when you start working with a child, you're a teacher. What we've got here is a whole confusion about qualifications. It's not about the qualification. That's important. But the task I'm talking about here, the task, the three-year-old who sits on the lap of the level three, and the three-year-old who sits on the lap of the, of the degree student next to her, makes no distinction because what they want both of those people to do is to teach them and care for them. So therefore we abandoned the language of practitioner a long time ago, because I think it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a fair descriptor of what we do. And I need you to think like that. I need you to think about this. You, don't, you can't hammer something like child poverty without really thinking about what our role is in this and our status is in that. And if the status is around teaching, then be a teacher. If you're a Montessori teacher, she never had a problem with that. I would have loved to have dinner with her. But, you know, they were teachers and they may well have done only a very short qualification. So let's not confuse qualifications with the role of what you do. But let me be clear. The qualifications matter. Absolutely matter. And we have a degree at LEAF. And it's taken me a long time to get a university to work with us and to design it with us and to roll it out with us. And we have now done that with the University of Wolverhampton. And we've now got it as a full top up and any of you guys that were interested could come and join us. We've got our own module about the LEAF pedagogy, all of that. So I'm not ever saying that degrees don't matter. But what I'm saying is what you do in the day matters. 
and how you describe that matters and the expectations you place on your staff matters. Then it's your job to support them, to make sure they're well trained and well qualified because that matters. And there you go. Uh, 10 years ago, I designed that when I was writing my first book on leadership. Look at what we do, guys. When you unpack it, and I've written a number of books since then, and, and I've just written another one on social leadership with a colleague of mine, Muna Sacker from the University of Middlesex. But look, we lead on the pedagogy. We lead and manage a service, and leading and managing are different. We lead in the community. We lead with parents. We lead our learning spaces, and we lead ourselves and others. All of those need a set of skills, knowledge, and understanding experience to work. That's, if you layer that and layer that and layer that, can you then stop saying, I'm just a nursery officer. I'm just a nursery manager. I just work with small children. Can you just stop that right now and look at actually what you do? And then when you're arguing for funding and you're arguing for status and you're arguing for what you are, you keep going back to this idea. This is what we do. This is significant. So how do we make a systemic change? We need to examine the models available and think about the cost benefits. That's what I'm saying to you. I need you to think about this through the lens of social leadership, social entrepreneurs. We definitely need to look at the model of social enterprise. You, you'll say, of course you say that, Julie, because you're obsessed. It's right, I am obsessed, but I think it works. I've proven that LEAF it works. I'd like to see more LEAF, not less LEAF, more LEAF. You need to invest in quality and guys, keep the ratios high. I saw um, randomly on a paper in a Telegraph uh, article just before um, <clears throat> just before the Conservative conference that they were talking about trying to stretch the ratios. They tried that in 2013. I I, I started a campaign and that was supported by a number a large number of people in the sector to make sure we keep our ratios high. Children need us to be for them. One to five babies is unacceptable as far as I'm concerned. And the fact that other parts of the world think this is okay is their problem, not ours. We're, we're good at what we do on the ratios. We are made, we're humans, male and female. We have one lap and two hips. That's one baby to each of those places. So no more. That's how we were designed and that's how it should stay. One lap, one hip, one hip. Three babies, one member of staff. No more than that. So if, if you're not reading my blogs or if you're not following me on Twitter, please do because I will call out on those things because I will really be concerned if we even slipped on any of that. And the fact that they can do this in other parts of the world, that's not our problem. Our problem is they should be doing what we do because we are good on ratios and we need to stick to ratios. We cannot afford, especially children from poorer families, to be in a position where they're a part of a big number. That's the, that's the joy of the early years. The numbers are small and you can have those personal relationships with those children. Never stop thinking about quality. Quality requires you to have your staff, requires you to have well-trained staff, a strong pedagogy and a set of structures that enable it to be measured and, and that you know what's going on. So you understand whether you can do it because you talk to each other, whether you have a cohort tracking system, whether you do your assessment, whichever, whatever you decide to do, that you can tell that a child is progressing or not, that you can spot where things are going awry. And also, I like a bit of cohort tracking because, it, I mean, we have a lot of nurseries, and so it helps you to find patterns. And we do a lot of action research. And one of the ways it comes is through the cohort tracking. So some of the deputies at LEAF spotted that the, the boys were not doing quite so well, particularly around maths. And we thought, well, well why, why is that? So we did our action research and discovered that actually we weren't using the outside well enough for them in terms of mathematical op opportunities. And guys, I do not mean putting an area outside called the maths area. This is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about multi-layered, interesting, resource clever activities, but smartening up the staff to actually use mathematical language appropriately to drive those kind of activities and experiences. The outside guys, by the way, is for the outside. It is not a classroom where you stick seven areas and stick it all around so the children can't actually do what they want to do outside, which is explore, love, laugh, run, you know, develop their skills differently outside. What they don't want to be going is from one area to the other outside. 
because that's the maths area outside and that's the reading area outside and stuff. This is mad. The children want to use the outside to do all of those things, but in an open and multi-layered way, but also in just in the joy. For so many of them, they haven't got garden. They're not taken to the park. This is the experience for them to live and learn outside in a more joyous way. And if you can't, if you don't like it because you're cold, get another job because outdoors is key. It's absolutely key to children's learning. You know, if you can't cope with it, you're in the wrong place. And if I found any leaf staff, which I never would, because they're all very, very, very engaged, standing outside, rubbing their shoulders, telling me how cold they are and are, are we're still, you know, having a cup of tea in the corner to, to warm up, watching the children running around and pointing their finger going, careful, oh, don't push, oh, stuff that you see in a playground. Well, frankly, that what's the point? It's just a miserable experience that takes me back to being a child. So, um, so really, the outdoors is joyous space for the wonderful learning, and particularly the boys really thrived, and we realised we hadn't been using it well enough. So that drives quality because it makes you keep thinking, and quality is about thinking, reflecting, taking a, taking notice of what's happening, and then doing something about it. It's the old traditional action research cycle. Use a social justice pedagogy, guys. Put put at the heart of the of your pedagogy, what drives social justice? And what drives social justice in very, very simple ways is what I said. It's about language. It's about deepening their experience. It's about making sure they've got the right stuff to be able to develop the right way. Whether that's welly boots or not welly boots, whether that's the right clothes, whether it's the right conversations, whether that's the right community engagement. That's the kind of thing you need to be, your head needs to hurt from talking about stuff like that. Your head needs to be, you know, at the end of it, of a staff meeting, it isn't that you've solved out who's going to do the, the rotors and the shifts and who's tidying up and who's finding the bits of the, the Lego that's missing. It's how are we going to drive social justice because we are with the smallest of our children. Lead for a social purpose. Um, I I've written about that, but it's in, in publication and that, that'll be forever in a day by the time that comes out. But anyway, it lays it out for you. Everybody is a, a pedagogical leader, whether you're a cleaner, an apprentice, a manager, a leader, an owner, you have a responsibility to be a pedagogical leader. And by that, you need to know how to lead those children to learn. That's what pedagogy means. It means how do you lead them to learn? And therefore, you need to understand that process. And it's not about all about curriculum. Could you sort yourselves out on the difference between pedagogy and curriculum? Please just sort it out. Curriculum are subjects that you teach. Pedagogy is the methods by which you lead people to learn, in particular children. That includes things like home learning. It includes things like your environment. It includes things like how you sort out the routine. It includes things like the lunch. It includes all sorts of things, whereas the curriculum are the subjects. And they are all obsessed with the EYFS, so you can use that as your curriculum if you need to. But there are other things in the world besides that, too. But that's a good start. And then finally, collaborate and build social capital. That's so important. And that starts with each other. We need to talk to each other more. We can be a little bit bitchy, it's true. And we can have what they call the, the Twitter vomit, God above, where people are so cross and angry, they don't know what to do, so they go on Twitter and then they just vomit all over it with full of negativity. Honestly, we don't need that. We work with children who give us hope. One of the things in, in, uh, during the, the, the lockdown when we had only 15 of our nurseries open to serve key, 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 um, key uh, person, you know, nurses, doctors, bus drivers, you know, people who kept the whole thing going, was that I used to have a three o'clock call with um, the nurseries, and I very much enjoyed it. And there was a couple of things that I noticed. And one was the children enjoy a slow pedagogy. And you know what I mean by that? I mean, time to just time to absorb, time to sit on the sofa, with the staff and just enjoy a cuddle and a conversation, time to finish the book properly, time to read the book again 58 million times, just time, just time to be. And the staff so enjoyed that as well because they didn't feel under pressure to get all the other stuff you have to do because they could actually breathe and relax. If you could bring some of that back, that would be amazing. The second thing was, before lockdown, I had banned all sorts of plastic, single-use plastic, and got rid of glitter. We were doing really well on sustainability. Some of the staff were having a bit of a heart attack that I wasn't letting them use gloves. But as I said, you know, where I came from in the original days, we washed the children's bottoms under the tap. 
with our hands and none of us died and we're all still here. And so, you know, getting rid of gloves and some people come uh, to me from other organizations and they put the gloves on to serve lunch. I mean, seriously, guys, when you're at home, do you put a pair of gloves on to serve your lunch? Ah, I don't think so. So the nursery is another home for the children. So anyway, we started to get rid of lots and lots of things and start to really think about it. And then, of course, COVID came and we were just piled high with PPE and we and we didn't really know quite what we were going to do. But then there was all this very negative narrative from the press and you know, doom and gloom and the world was terrible and everyone was vomiting on Twitter. And um, and and I had these glorious conversations with these three and four year olds and two year olds every day at three o'clock. And I suddenly thought, we have the future in our hands. We need to think about sustainability in a much bigger way. We need to think about how we support these children to find a way of creating the next world. Now we can't do that in the, we know nothing about technology and all that sort of stuff. Oh, we may know a bit, but what we needed to do was build hope and build hope through sustainability. It's become my new thing. Sadly, for the whole of the LEAF staff, they're really like, oh, God, she's on that now. But, you know, the fact is, it's true. And the more I study it, and the more I learn about it, and the more I read about it, and the more I see it, I just think we have got the most glorious job in that we can see these just delightful children who are hopeful and curious and, you know, explorers. And we need them to take us forward. And our job is to create some kind of supportive framework. So you need to jump into the sustainability conversation. We need to understand what we un, what we be, mean by that. And you just need to figure out just one tiny step towards it. It doesn't have to be a big deal. You don't have to be the climate change changes. You don't, you know, but, you know, when you think about sustainability, there are three arms to sustainability. One is social, one is economic, and one is environmental. And today we looked at the, the economic one because we looked at child poverty. Because if you think about the sustainable development goals, and I've written a lot about this on my blogs, and um, we've done quite a bit of work on that. So we can really help you out with that. And we have a course on it and all sorts of things if you're interested. But the starting point is number one is no more poverty. No more poverty, guys. It's not about, you know, eating vegan meat or, you know, worrying about methane and carbon. First starts with poverty. It's when you unpack poverty and it starts to go out, not just from, you know, around where you live, the city you live in, London, the UK poverty is created by <clears throat> a lack of sustainability that impacts on children far and wide across the world and I won't put you off your avocados but you know every time you have your avocado in the middle of winter somebody in other parts of the world can't afford an avocado because it's been shipped over here so we need to think about all of those decisions we make whether we what we what we do but you just start with no more poverty and you've made a really good start then on touching on sustainability, touching on systemic change, and starting to think more broadly about the whole issue. Okay, so thank you very much. Oh yeah, that's, um, gosh, that's obviously me on drugs here, writing all these books and running Leaf at the same time. I'm obviously, uh, there's too many, there's too many bubbles in my, in my sparkling water by the looks of things. But anyway, if you're interested, we have podcasts, we have TED Talks, we have books, we have webinars. We are, we are like this kind of tech world. And we're always grateful for good conversations and more engagement. And thank you so much. And it feels really weird not to be able to talk to you, but, uh, you know, these, these, are the, these are the modern days. June, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was just fantastic <laughs> and inspirational. I have so many notes written down, you wouldn't believe um we've got questions coming in and i encourage anybody else who'd like to ask anything to please do so put it in the chat and we'll read them out and ask for june's opinion um a couple of points from me june if i may start um one of your opening points was that childcare is part of our infrastructure i've never thought of it like that and as soon as you said it it was so completely obvious <laughs> um why do you think that we don't treat childcare that way uh, because it's it, you know, it is so fundamental to the success of society. So, sorry, what 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 was the question? Well, you you use the term childcare. I uh, no no, I got I got that. What are you actually asking? So me? the question is, why do you think that it's not treated that way? Why ah, do you think that it's not usually yeah, uh, re yeah. referenced in that way because it's so fundamental? 
Well, I think it, I think it's because we don't use that language often enough. You know, I don't think we think about it, and therefore, language is so important and so powerful that if you're not using that, and and I hate to sound uh, sort of a bit trendy now, but you know, this narrative, we we need to own our own narrative, and our narrative really is that we are part of national infrastructure. If you think seventy six percent of women um, want to return to work, so so we create a society where we encourage women to train and develop, and um, and then women continue to have children because we need the um, we need the population to to sort of maintain us because we're all going to be old one day and need someone to look after us and so um, we've created that kind of structure and then we don't put around it a kind of infrastructure that enables them to benefit from it so what's the point in putting all women to work and then not provide a service to them for them to be able to actually work you know but but not just that can't be good enough it has to be better for, for the children as well so we can't just then create kind of you know dumping grounds for children we have to then create great nurseries for children and so if you think about the tax receipts from women working i mean what is how does the how does the treasury benefit from the tax receipts from the women working i'd love to do some real research on that and what does that cost in terms of the five miserable percent from the dfe's funding i would say that the treasury is doing pretty well by having women working, women want to work. That's great, and um, and and benefit the, the economy. But also, they have to have some structural support. So my question would be to the feminists out there: How have you failed us? Because as a feminist, I you know how is it we still haven't got high quality, accessible, great nursery provision for our children, and we're still begging for it. Yet there's big campaigns about things that don't that touch only a tiny minority of people, a tiny, tiny, tiny minority of people. Yet most women at some point will either be supporting a family, be rearing a family or be involved in some way in a family. Yet this is not the national narrative. The national narrative should be you want women to work. You respect women. You want to support women. Women's rights should be surely, therefore, that we provide them with a brilliant childcare system they can afford and they can use. So I pushed at the feminists every year on Women's Day, I've asked feminists, why have we not won this battle? That's, that's fascinating. I have to say, I'm sure everybody on this call uh, appreciates your directness, June. And, oh, I'm sorry, uh, we, I'm sorry, is it too much? No, we love it, we <laughs> love it. But um, not only your directness about, about feminism, but um, I'm sure we've all got new vernacular too. My, my latest vernacular that I didn't know prior to this call is Twitter vomit, which I think is just <laughs> fabulous. And I love it. What an amazing terminology. I think it's probably Facebook and uh, Instagram vomit, but we all know exactly what you meant. Oh, I, I don't touch them. <laughs> um, I wanted to go back a little bit. You <laughs> talked about child poverty uh, costing £25 billion. Pounds. Uh -huh. I mean, that's just an obscene amount of money. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Um, well, that's really about the cost of not having people in a job that gives them enough money to actually be able to run their own families, uh, effect, you know, effectively and be able to basically afford the cost of housing and um, and tra transport and indeed childcare. So it's all the so-called sort of supports services are what you might call a benefit, add on benefits that actually are just a mealy manly way of keeping people poor and actually not paying them properly. Uh, so for me, that's where that all goes. And, and I, I would, as I say, I would love to have a serious group of people who come together, economists, you know, business people, uh, early years people, and, um, you, you know, uh, mathematicians and do some calculation on this and actually get some real color around it so we could really describe this because it is quite shameful we're prepared to put money into a support service and not actually put money into people's pockets so they can actually drive and there's real issues that you know that's why i say about being in early years you think you're just going to work with small children suddenly you're touching on huge issues like structural issues like housing you know our staff can't afford to live in the neighborhood that they grew up in or in the neighborhood that we need them to work. So they move farther and farther out to zone sixes and beyond. We are then trying to support them as key workers to get a decent place to live. They are then spending all of the money that they've maybe benefited from on the transport back in to serve to service people who can afford to have nurseries in high-end areas who are paid 
a lot more money. It, it kind of makes you feel very uncomfortable, doesn't it? It makes you feel very uncomfortable about the unfairness of this. And as care being so um, undervalued, you know, that as a society. I mean, why, why is a, a, a banker getting paid half a million quid for earning more money for a small group of people? And people who work in care are in, you know, in, in the other end of the spectrum. And, you know, to even get them to the London living wage, which is my big ambition and is really hard to try and achieve, actually, you know, even with the most wizardry I can finally get to, that why we can't get our staff to a guarantee. Now, I'm not saying that leave staff are not on the London living wage. Most of them are, but there's still some that are not. But I can't get them to 10.85 an hour because of the structure that is around the sector that is actually key to the infrastructure of this modern society. Well, how is that, how is that even still happening? How is it we're not talking about this? How is it that people are up in arms about this? How is it fair that as a, some kind of business consultant, you can earn half a million quid to make someone else richer? But for the rest of us who support all of that by running, driving the buses and the tubes and, you know, cleaning the streets and, you know, providing the care and elderly homes are in, in, in childcare, where somehow or other perceived as not valued even for London living wage. I mean, doesn't it, it makes me up at night. It makes me angry. It's wrong. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, I'd certainly, if you ever uh, want to put a team together to look at uh, the real cost, then count me and my team in on that because uh, we would love to become involved. June, you went. You went on to talk about. I went on. I'm sure I went on, Alan. Yeah. <laughs> but, you, but, you, but you talked about sustainability at length, and you mentioned the, the global goals or the sustainability goals, and yet. Yeah. Uh, you know, global goals is part of uh, Parentis DNA, is part of all of my staff's DNA. And yet the global goals really are not part of the UK uh, vernacular. There are some people who are very au fait with them. And uh, there are an awful lot of businesses. There are an awful lot of early year settings who really aren't aware of them. We have these amazing campaigns of all these mega stars talking about the global goals, but it's still not really caught on in the UK. Why do you think that is? It's basically because people don't know what they're talking about for the most part. So they fixate on one or two things, especially those celebrity types, to be honest. Uh, they fixate on things and they confuse the narrative, I think, and people just don't know how to engage. But for the early year sector, number four, guys, number four is quality education for every child. That's it. So you know the way you talk about the United Nations uh, rights of a child. You ought to be talking about sustainability development goal number four equally. It's about the access to education. I think uh, it's it's uh, it's new, and I worry a little bit about this. Um, this is a subject of actually my PhD, to be honest. Um, but um, I'm and I'm trying to look at a way of creating pedagogical conversations so that people are so comfortable about talking about SDGs and stuff that they can actually start to persuade their colleagues about it, and it's going to come out like a kind of a ripple effect, rather, because the uh, consequent the other consequence is that we end up with a kind of a toolkit or a tick box system or, you know, a set of targets that you have added on to your daily activities. And that is perceived, therefore, as sustainability. I mean, Nick Corlett is, is one of the LEAF managers and he, he was, he's, a, he's been a real partner in crime with me on this because he's really very, very keen on it. And he's Australian and, uh, and came with this kind of passion because it's quite part of the Australian uh, educational uh, framework um, and we've we wrote a book during lockdown for 50 fantastic activities to develop sustainability in early years and that really was just to give little steps to get people thinking and I just think that's where we have to start Alan you know we have to just start with small steps because otherwise the whole thing feels completely overwhelmed and you just think well what can I do in my little nursery you know I just think well you can do you can start thinking about it or you can just read a little bit about it you can understand that why having a wormery is an important thing why just recycling your food waste in the kitchen is a good thing you know just small steps like that but I think the bigger narrative you have to wait for my book on sustainability I'm on that now but you know um but uh but really it's about uh, our joining us on our on our on our course on this just to start the conversation wider and wider 
problem we have in early years is things get dumped on us all the time from the top. And I really don't want sustainability to be another thing to do. Actually, I want it to be a thing to be. And we see it as part of our kind of legacy to our to our children uh, because we, we drive it. And I, I, I think it's a really good thing to drive from our uh, perspective because it's a positive thing. It's, um, well, I know it might feel like it's not positive, but you know what I mean? It's a positive way of taking control of something that you can do. And it's a positive way of raising a conversation in a way that's not doom and gloom, but actually is about look, these small things all make a difference. Um, so that's really where we're going with the sustainability thing. I'm not overly keen on the, as I say, the tick box so that, um, but let's see. I mean, you know, if people are interested in this, I'm happy to set up the uh, a London uh, sustainability network and we can just have conversations about the whole thing. Thank you. I, uh, I think uh, your views on uh, sustainability and the Global Goals are very aligned to mine. Um, for everybody else's benefit, we'll put some links to the Global Goals uh, into the emails which come out after this event, along with the slides that uh, June has shared with us and a copy of this recording. But June, uh, uh, I don't know if you're aware, that, but Parenta has a charity which we have 1,200 uh, children under uh, six in schools across Africa. And uh, I agree with you, it shouldn't be a tick box, it should be absolutely ingrained in what we all do. So thank you for sharing that view. Um, my last question, June, uh, it's not a question, it's a statement, but I, um, I found one of your comments uh, really important and it's something that I share. And you talked about how you've been uh, to see uh, nurseries and childcare providers across the globe, as I have, I've been to over a thousand nursery schools. And wherever you are in the world, they all say the same as you've just said, which is just, I'm just a, I'm just a nursery nurse. I'm just a childcare practitioner. And I, I, I concur with your sentiment. It's quite sad that it's not, you know, there should be absolute pride behind that, but it's it's almost like a browbeaten uh, uh, area, isn't it? And I just, I thought your insight on that was fascinating. I know, and I, I think, um... I'm going to sound quite sexist here, but you know me, I really don't care. I'll just say what I say. Um, we're mostly female dominated. And I think as women, we're just hopeless at actually standing up for ourselves from that point of view. I mean, you know, to the women on this call right now, when someone says to you, you're looking good, that's a great jumper you're wearing there, Glendalyn. You know, Carol, you look like a really busy woman and I love the way you've plaited your hair. You know, Anne, you're, you know, it's really lovely that your blonde hair and lovely smile, you're very encouraging to me all the way through this. I've seen my gorgeous Marita, a deputy at Carlton Hill on, on the face. I see a really bouncy person called Linda Smith. You know, lovely smile, lovely lipstick. The rest of you have hidden your faces, so I don't know. But, you know, when I say things like that, oh, there's another person who's just bounced in as well. Um, you all smile, but you know, if I said it to you, your face, you'd go, oh, that's just an old yellow thing I found in the cupboard. Or, oh, no, 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 I, I was in a hurry this morning. I couldn't do my hair well. Or, oh, um, oh, I got that cheap from, you know, from somewhere. That's what you do, because that's how we are. And we're not, that's not actually great. Now, I don't want you to become all Kardashian on all of this, you know, and actually be really, um, and be really like, oh, it's all about me. Or oh, that awful L'Oreal, you know, because you're worth it. You know, we don't want that either. But at the same time, I think as a sector, we often downgrade ourselves because we are more inclined to be female. I mean, my big campaign, of course, is to encourage men into childcare because I think you need a gender balance in, 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 in any workplace. And, and it's good for everyone. Uh, it's good for men. It's good for women. It's good for children to have more gender uh, balance in our nurseries. But we don't want men brought in as a kind of token or as on a white charger to sort out our problems either. You know, we want equitable and equal relationships with them. And it works very well when, when, you, when, when you do that. So I think it's partly because of the perception we have of ourselves, Alan. And I think it's partly because we feel downgraded and because we kind of absorb the kind of society view that we are just working with small children. And small children in our society, every, many, many societies are just not valued. Um, they're just not seen. And they're not considered. And I don't mean that, you know, those little brats that are allowed to, you know, jump into conversations. There's no manners about them. There's no framework. I don't mean that by any means. You kind of see them on Netflix. You know, if you're watching you, 
you see some really, you know, badly behaved children. Um, but, you know, it's really about understanding boundaries and understanding the role children have in society, the understanding the uh, contribution that they're going to make, understanding our role in relation to that. We don't articulate that at all. So what you end up getting is us kind of giving up our whinging, our um, just saying this pointless, this hopeless, I can't do this kind of thing. And then that's absorbed by the sector. And we just believe our own our own stuff. And, and actually, we're not. We're early years care and education teachers. We're delivering the foundation for the, the population as growing. The biggest child development um, uh, <clears throat> development opportunities are in the north to five. The children's brains are zizzing at a billion um, synaptic connections a minute. The contribution we make to the children's development is essential. We set the foundations, and I mean that, we set the foundations for their cognitive development, their physical development, their social development. Nobody, nobody, nobody does as much as we do. Yet primary school, secondary school gets a lot of the credit, but actually us on our 5% actually do, the, do a lot of the groundwork. And surely it's the right of every child in this country to have affordable, accessible and high quality education and to be supported by well-qualified, well-respected and high status staff and not to be spending our entire time trying to make two pence go a long way so that we can actually stay open. That's, that's the narrative we need to be supporting. And I think we need to get our act together and get that right, because otherwise we end up in that kind of sort of deficit sort of situation where it's, um, you know, we're making things work and we're sort of making ends meet. That's not what we're about. We're not about, you know, <clears throat> making leftovers. We're about making the main dish. And that's the important thing. And I'm really up for conversations with as many people as possible. So we're not about survival and competing and trying to you know, see it through, because that's what happens with the marketplace. And a marketplace doesn't solve poverty. What we are about is having a conversation of a bunch of like-minded, um, in intelligent, capable people who are like who are trying to drive through structural change that makes a difference to the future population. I mean, that if you go away now and make your cup of tea, or you have to do stuff, or you're the nursery manager and has to get on with it, can you please play with those those words? Because you, until you believe that, until you say, "Oh, that's not an old thing I found in the back of the cupboard," until you believe who you are and what you do, we're never going to shift the dial on this, guys. I agree completely. Um, <laughs> June, thank you. I'm going to ask for my team to start to wrap it up because we're, <laughs> we're 12 minutes overdue. June, that was fantastic. I'm sure every single person benefited hugely from hearing you speak today. And as I said earlier, we've all got new vernacular and uh, I'm sure a lot of us have, uh, have specific places we need to go and look and research. So thank you, June. Thank you so much for your time today. We thoroughly enjoyed it. I'm going to clap my hands. Nobody else will be able to hear me, but I really do appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, everybody. You Thank you for joining us today. If you have any further questions, just put them on the thread or send them through to our team. We will, of course, send through a copy of this presentation, a copy of June's slides, and, as I said, link to the Global Goals later on. Uh, probably come out towards the end of the day because we have to wait for this recording to come in. It's all sort of technological stuff that takes forever. Uh, other than that, I don't think we're running another seminar in December, so you all get a month off, but we look forward to joining you all again in January. All the best, everybody. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you. Thank you all.